morning once again, everyone. God bless you all, and special thanks to our newly expanded worship team. Thanks, guys. We appreciate you very much. Well, this morning, dear church family, we're going to be in the book of 1 Samuel. And if you can locate 1 Samuel chapter 4, that's where we're going to be. And just for our visitors' sake, and maybe as an aid to the memory, uh, this church under God is endeavoring to go through the whole Bible together, and we record all the sermons, and they go on to the church website, and there's something like an audio commentary that's slowly developing. And so you're invited to go back at any time and, and uh, listen to those messages again and get reacquainted with some of these things that we've already looked at. But if the Lord doesn't return and I don't die, <laughs> we're going to get through the book of Revelation one of these days. And I better start moving right now or we're never going to get there. Just as a review here, we're, we are consulting 1 Samuel. And uh, remember, we're still in the books of history. These are history books in the Old Testament. We are about 1,000 years before Jesus was born. So this is something like 3,000 years ago. And uh, National Ethnic Israel, that's God's special people group in the world. Uh, and the days are very dark right now as we are putting into 1 Samuel. There is uh, confusion. There is religious corruption. And uh, the word of God we saw last time was rare, very rare. There was no widespread revelation. There was no universally acknowledged uh, spokesman for God. I'm okay, thank you. And um, we're going to see, though, that as dark as things were at that time, God had not forgotten his people. Things are about to change, and I'm happy to announce that. And uh, this is just a gentle reminder to all of us. You know, you're going to pass through dark times, and so will I. Maybe you already have. God hasn't forgotten you. I promise you, he hasn't forgotten you. You consult the Bible, consult the pages of Scripture. Uh, watch how God deals with his people, those who have entered into love, trust, covenant relationship with him. Sometimes they pass through very difficult things, but I promise you, he hasn't forgotten. And when you come out the other side of that, sooner or later you're going to realize he will show you why you were meant to pass through those things. You'll see it was for a greater good, a purpose of a greater good. It's kind of important that we understand that, okay? Uh, but here in Israel's history, yes, things are about to get much, much better for Israel, but first they need to learn some hard lessons. And we want to learn those things as we read the Bible so we don't make those mistakes like they did. You know, we get to learn from Israel's mistakes so we don't repeat these things. Well, let's take a look here at uh, chapter 4, beginning verse 1. It says, the word, of the, of, uh, the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines, that's their arch enemies, the Philistines, and encamped beside Ebenezer, and the Philistines camped at Aphek. Then the Philistines put themselves in battle array against Israel, and when they joined battle, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men of the army in the field. And when the people had come in, into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh to us, that when it comes among us, it may save us from the hand of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of hosts who dwells between the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, that's the high priest Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. And when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted so loudly that the earth shook. Now when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What does the sound of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews mean? Then they understood that the Ark of the Lord had come into the camp, and the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, Woe to us, for such a thing has never happened before. Woe to us! Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. Be strong and conduct yourselves like men, you Philistines, that you do not become servants of the Hebrews as they have been to you. Conduct yourselves like men and fight. So the Philistines fought and Israel was defeated. Every man fled to his tent and there was a gr very great slaughter. And there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers also the ark of God was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. Well, what an account, what a powerful account here. 
Before we're done today, I think you're going to feel like you've been on a roller coaster. This looks like a very downward sort of slide in Israel's history. Uh, Israel, by and large, was somewhat estranged from God. And they received the promised punishment for that estrangement. God had already told these people numerous times, if you walk away from me, you uh, deny and suppress the truth I'm giving you, and you follow after other gods, and you walk in darkness like that, I will see that you are punished, and your punishment will come in the form of military defeat. That's very clear. It will be Gentile hostility, aggression, and suppression. That's what will happen to you. Just as God promised, here it is. And so they were defeated soundly by the Philistines. And uh, I think we want to acknowledge that not all of Israel was wicked and totally depraved at this time. Right? I mean, there are some good people still in Israel, but, you know, the message here, I think, is that there is a connectedness within national ethnic Israel. When enough people are walking in darkness, the whole nation suffers. You know, friends, and this is a gentle reminder that even today in, in the light of New Testament realities, even within the New Covenant relationship, even within the local church assembly, uh, a person walking in darkness can affect the whole, the whole community of believers. You know, you could take something very low level. I mean, you could be going around saying you are a member of such and such a church, and then uh, people on the outside, they see you in the bar getting drunk and conducting yourself in uh, a way that's really unbecoming of a Christian. We'll say maybe you're a little crooked with your business dealings or something. That is going to influence the whole church assembly. It's going to uh, profoundly influence all of us. It could give us all a bad reputation, and I think there are probably uh, countless ways we can imagine that, a, that a, a saint that is not walking in a way that's becoming of a saint can, uh, can bring darkness on the whole group of us. Just a little reminder that we're all connected. We're all in this together, and so we should all be encouraging and helping one another, right? And thinking the best of each other. And, um, and that's kind of important. And you see this, the communal aspect here of national ethnic Israel. And today... The, the very real communal aspect of the church of Jesus Christ. It's really important that we understand these things here. Sin affects others. Didn't we see that with Achan? He took from Jericho those, those despised things he was not supposed to take, and at the very next battle, the battle of Ai, which should have been a uh, walk in the park, Israel, the whole uh, military campaign w turned out to be an utter defeat, a failure, because of one man's sin. We're all in this together, remember now. Well, here, in this account, didn't we see some religious superstition here going on? Israel saw that they were defeated, and they said, well, here, you know what we'll do? We'll just go get the Ark of the Covenant, because the Ark of the Covenant is the most sacred piece of furniture in the tabernacle, and inside that chest resides the tablets, the, ta the tablets of the Ten Commandments that God wrote on with his own finger, and, um, well, we'll just go get that chest, and that, that, this talisman here, this, this artifact. This will protect us in battle. See, that's called religious superstition. And, uh, of course, they were soundly disabused of this false idea. God was showing these people he will not be manipulated. There are no guaranteed formulas for success. And I think that this is a very, very powerful reminder to us. I mean, you just read the account. Who's the flag wavers in all this? It's Hophni and Phinehas. And we saw these guys earlier. They are wicked. They are depraved. They are absolutely walking in darkness. They are ungodly. Uh, total, uh, they bring total shame on the house of God, these two. And there they are. They are the flag wavers behind this whole operation. We'll just go get the ark, and then we are guaranteed to succeed. Well, I mean, their presence in the middle of all this almost guarantees the operation to be a, a failure, right? And it was. And um, this is God telling us, we are not going to manipulate him. You're not just going to go get a, a lock of saint's hair or something, or appeal to some weeping Madonna somewhere, or some other so-called sacred piece of furniture, or some talisman, and, and now you, God's guaranteed to help you. No, absolutely not. And this is the kind of thinking, I'm sorry, that is common among the health and wealth prosperity gospel heretics. I don't mean to be calling people down, but they, they, they somehow got it in their heads that you just... Uh, perform the right formulas, and you are going to be healthy, wealthy, prosperous, successful. You'll never have a day of trouble in your life. I've heard that kind of thing. Absolutely wrong. 
And God is showing us, you're not going to manipulate him. You will not just uh, utter the right words thoughtlessly, heartlessly. You'll not just pick yourself up a talisman or something, and now God is guaranteed to, to help you. You know, I've seen men counsel others, and I've watched them do it. They will come and bring their tithe and offering, and they will put it in the box, and they will say, money come to me, because that false preacher was telling them, if you tithe regularly, you'll be absolutely wealthy, and you'll be able to drive a real nice car and all the rest of it. That is not what God promised. He didn't promise those things. Your reward is in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break through and steal, right? Store up for yourselves treasure in heaven. And if, as a matter of fact, where your treasure is, there your heart will be, Jesus said. Isn't that, isn't that true? And all those who will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer what? Persecution. And we may through, we must, Paul says, through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. It sounds to me like the Christian walk is not, is not a walk in the park. It's not a picnic. Uh, in many ways, it's a battlefield, isn't it? You know, and, and Jesus said, I want you to, you know, if I could paraphrase the Lord, he says, count the cost. Think about it before you become a Christian. Things may get a little harder, even, as you walk through a world that is satanically dominated right now. And John says, the whole world lies in the sway of the wicked one. You see? And Jesus said, woe to you when all men speak good of you. The things that are well spoken of are abominable to the Lord, the Bible says. And, to, you know, to walk as a Christian, you almost have to flip your perceptions right upside down. <laughs> Don't you? Yeah. And uh, all that just to say that um, we gotta, we're going to operate the way God tells us. We're going to believe the promises he's actually made to us and not the fakey promises that some are making on his behalf. Okay? Let's, let's not be superstitious. Let's just be sober-minded Christians who believe what God says in his word, the Bible. Right? Well, the other thing I want to point out here is, aren't you impressed, I know that I'm very impressed, with Philistine courage? Those Philistines are pretty impressive. Now, they're totally depraved. <laughs> they are the enemies of God's people, um, but they are a courageous bunch. They are aware that they have a supernatural enemy that has aligned himself with Israel. They're aware of a supernatural enemy here with tremendous power. They know about the exodus. They know about the plagues. They know about the Red Sea opening. They are afraid of God. They are afraid of Jehovah God, and they should be. But you know what they did? They took courage and they talked themselves into this thing and they were actually successful. Never, dear friends, underestimate the resolve of the unregenerate. Never underestimate their resolve. We had a bunch of depraved people there in Sodom and Gomorrah, remember? Struck blind, supernatural blindness, and they wearied themselves trying to find the door so they could victimize the people inside. They wearied themselves. I mean, they were bent on doing that. We're going to do this thing. We don't care what gets, what gets in the way. And in this case, they said, we're going to defeat Israel, and we don't care what supernatural forces may be on their side. I mean, that's, uh, it's a little bit crazy, but it is courageous. I think there's something commendable to that. Never underestimate the resolve of the unregenerate. They fought Israel. They prevailed over Israel. And I would say, dear friends, we ought to display at least as much courage as they did, though our adversaries in the world be strong and numerous and led by a supernatural enemy, namely Satan himself and his forces. You can, on the authority of the word of God, look any Satanist, witch, Wiccan, any depraved person you want who is following Satan, you can, on the authority of the word of God, look them square in the eye and you can say, my master made your master, and he has made me to sit with him in heavenly places, as a matter of fact, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. Now that is Ephesians 1 and 2, friends. And Jesus said it, didn't he? He said to his people, I have given you authority over serpents and scorpions and over all power of the enemy. Now those are promises from God to us, his people. We're not to become arrogant, rude, flippant, 
offensive to people. We're not to just set out to do those things. But as a matter of fact, there is no reason for a saint of God to be afraid. We can be like Paul. We can say, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation for the Jew first and also for the Greek. I think we should display at least as much courage as the Philistines. And so that's my encouragement today to all of us. Take courage. The world is dark. It's depraved. It's satanically dominated. Yes, but we have a master in heaven who has promised not to leave or forsake us. We can take courage, and that courage is not ill-founded. It rests squarely on the word of God, the promises of Jesus, and his promises are sure. Yes and amen always, aren't they? Yes. If we were to just synopsize the next few verses here, someone ran from the battlefield and told Eli, the high priest, said, both your sons have died and Israel's been defeated. And uh, Eli, as promised, you know, he just sort of fell over and died. He was so shocked and horrified, so, so affected by this horrible news that Israel had been defeated and the Ark of the Covenant had been taken that he just died on the spot. And God had made good on his promises to punish that family. Because of Eli's unwillingness to correct his depraved sons, because of their wickedness, wickedness they, are, or they were uh, absolutely bent on doing evil. They refused to repent. And so, as promised, that family was, was punished. And Eli died on the spot. Eli was greatly troubled, and Israel was greatly troubled. There was a general sense that God had forsaken Israel. And uh, meanwhile, the Ark of the Covenant had been taken by Israel's despised enemies. They took the Ark. That was their prize. We have Israel's most sacred piece of furniture. And you know what they did with the Ark? They put it in their pagan temple, the temple to Dagon, their god. And they had a big statue of Dagon in the temple. And they parked the Ark of the Covenant right there. Dagon, that's your treasure. That is, that's to honor you. Israel's God is over here now to honor you. And you know what happened? You know what happened in that temple? Twice that statue was found lying face down in front of the ark. God just sort of knocked it over, and the Philistines sort of got the message. Hey, this God, uh, I think, is maybe a little more powerful than our God. He can knock him on his face. In fact, the second time, the, the heads in the hand, or the head in the hands were, were busted off the, the statue. And um, if I can just share, I don't know if I should share this, but I think I will, just will. <laughs> the Christmas tree has nothing to do with God. You know that, right? I mean, the Christmas tree has nothing to do with Jesus. I won't condemn anybody who has a Christmas tree in their home. We had one in our home for years. No problem. You won't see one on this platform, though. It's pagan. It has nothing to do with the Lord. And I remember years ago, Lindy and I were confronted with this this Christmas tree, should we really have one in our house? Is it right for us in our home to have one? And uh, all of a sudden that tree just sort of fell over on its own. And uh, how many times that thing fall over? Three times. Middle of the night, we hear this ruckus. I came downstairs, uh, came outside my bedroom. There's the thing laying flat. Pick it up, fell over. Finally, I leaned it into the corner. I said, okay, this is angle here. <laughs> this tree is not going anywhere now. This angle. Would you know that thing fell over again? You know what I did? Right out into the snow. Four o'clock in the morning, open the door, into the garden with you. I don't want you in my house anymore. <laughs> so I don't know if, that, if God is telling me something, but we never had a tree since then. <laughs> it just reminded me of Dagon a little bit there, you know. But you understand, I'm not condemning anyone who chooses to have a tree. That's fine. But uh, yeah, it just reminded me of what happened with Dagon. Well, these uh, Philistines, not only was their God falling on his face, but the Philistines were experiencing plagues, plagues from God. And so they would move this ark from place to place until in uh, chapter 5 and in verse 11, they finally got the message that we shouldn't have this ark among us anymore. They said, send away this ark of God of Israel, let it go back to its own place. And uh, they got the message. The Philistines got the message. Their gods were no, no match for the God of Israel, for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They got the message. So they sent the ark back on a cart pulled by a couple cows, and they put golden offerings on the, ar on, on the cart. They said, we've offended this great God of Israel. We better just send this thing back, and we'll put some offerings there, and maybe these plagues will be lifted off of us. So they, they sent it back, and they learned something there, and we have too. 
you're not going to trifle with the God of Israel. You will, you will not just try to sort of victimize his people. You won't take those things that he calls holy and adopt them as your own uh, and treat them in an unworthy manner. It just won't happen. You will feel the wrath of God if you try it. And they learn the hard way about that. So the ark found its way to, back to Israel, and it came to a place called Beth Shemesh. And the Levites, you remember that's the priestly class, Within the tribe of Levi, you have people who attend the, the tabernacle, and, in, and in, within that group, you have a special group called the priests. The Levites are the guys entrusted to attend at the tabernacle, and then you have the priests within that little community. They have special functions in the tabernacle. And we are told that they offered sacrifice. Uh, when the ark came back, they were very happy, and the scene looks very happy. It's a very joyous sort of thing. The Philistines have been spanked, God has been vindicated, the ark has returned to its rightful place, sacrifices have been offered, and, and people are rejoicing, everyone's very happy. Well, listen to what happened next here. Now, this is in chapter 6, beginning verse 19. Chapter 6, beginning verse 19. And we are absolutely shocked when we read this. So you're going to see, this feels like a roller coaster. Verse 19. Then he struck the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark. He struck 50,070 men of the people and, and the people lamented because the ark, oh sorry, because the Lord had struck the people with a great slaughter. And the men of Beth Shemesh said, who is able to stand before this holy Lord God and to whom shall it go up from us? So they sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kir Kirjath-Jerim saying, the Philistines have brought back the ark of the Lord, come down and take it up with you. Then the men of Kirjath-Jerim came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Aminadab on the hill and consecrated Eleazar his son to keep the ark of the Lord. So it was that the ark remained at Kirjath-Jerim a long time and it was there 20 years and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. What a harsh judgment. What a letdown. It looks so happy. Things look so good. And what a nosedive. Things have taken a real turn for the worst. Harsh judgment. But friends, I want to say something. These people knew better. They had the Mosaic Law. They had the Book of Numbers. The Book of Numbers, chapter 4 and verse 20, tells us not even the people among the Levites could watch the holy articles being covered. They weren't even allowed to look at that. Never mind some common layman coming along and lifting the lid off the ark and having a look. That was not to be done. And God struck those people dead. They were going to learn something about the holiness of God. And they're going to learn something about the administrative order that God had set up there in Israel. And that's sort of a gentle reminder to all of us in living in the church age. The church of Jesus Christ is to function in an orderly manner. It is there are instructions in the Bible for how the church functions. There's administrative order and function. Paul says, let all things be done decently and in order. The church of Jesus Christ is a body with members, and each member ha is designed and intended by God to perform some specific tasks. And we're seeing a shadow of that in Israel's history, and we see in Israel's history the devastating results when people color outside the lines. And they think they're going to do things their way and not God's way. And if we decide to run the church the way we think is best, I mean, this is what's happening, right, in, in the world, isn't it? We think God's instructions for the church are a little outmoded now. We think they're a little outdated. They need revision. And so we're going to, we're going to get along with the world now. We're going to get into the 21st century, and we're going to run things the way the world thinks is politically correct. It'll be disastrous for the church. You might fill every seat in the place, but spiritually it'll be a disaster. And we're learning from Israel's history. Let's not make those mistakes. Let's do things his way. We are here believers, and we are a functioning priesthood with specific duties and responsibilities and privileges. And let's take those things seriously. And let's do as we're told to do. Okay? Now, we want to say that God was obligated by his character to keep his word. I mean, he said, you don't worship me the way I have ordained, you don't handle the furniture of the tabernacle the way I say, there's going to be punishment. There's going to be consequences. You remember the two sons of Aaron. 
They offered strange fire before the Lord, and they were burned to a crisp right there in Leviticus 10. God is showing us we'll approach him on his terms, and we're going to do as he says. And his commands are not burdensome. He loves us. He gives us commands for our own good. But if we think he doesn't mean it, we are seriously deceiving ourselves. He means it. You remember Hebrews chapter 2. Don't you dare refuse him who speaks from heaven. Or you're going to feel the same sort of punishments those Israelites feel, it's not, felt. It's not a good idea. God is obligated by his character to keep his word. And friends, what would we think of a God who went back on his word? He says to Adam, original man Adam, don't eat of that tree. You eat of that tree, you're dead. And so Adam ate of the tree. What would we think of a God who said, well, okay, just this once, I'll let it go. We, I mean, we, you, know what the, you know what would happen? We would be left in hopeless darkness. We'd be left in ignorance because the ultimate authority, God, can't be trusted. We can't discern his intentions by what he tells us. He wouldn't be trustworthy. But as a matter of fact, God shows us throughout the entire Bible he is 100% trustworthy. And when he says this is the punishment for doing this, he means it. He also says... Here are the blessings for those who love and trust me. I mean it. See? And, and I just want to encourage everyone who hears my voice to love and trust him and take him at his word, okay? The ark is sitting here for 20 years. 20 years? What were you doing back in 1998? Do you remember 1998? Styles have changed a little bit. <laughs> 20 years. You know, we're learning something about God's timetable. God doesn't just rush through things. God has a timetable. He has an agenda. He has a chronology. And we live in a fast food generation. Give me what I want right now. God says, no. There are some things you're not going to learn unless you take the time. You're going to have to experience some things. And the lesson will take 20 years in this case. 20 years. The ark sits there. A lesson in the patience and acceptability of God's timetable. Well, finally, God spoke after 20 years. Listen to this one. Chapter 7, verse 3. Chapter 7, verse 3. Then Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel, saying, If you return to the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths from among you and prepare your hearts for the Lord and serve him only. He will de deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So the children of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtoreths, these are false gods, and serve the Lord only. And Samuel said, Gather all the Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered together at Mizpah, drew water, and poured it out before the Lord, and they fasted that day, and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel at Mizpah. Look at this. We are reminded once again, as we are reminded every week, that heart position with God is paramount. He doesn't really care that much about outward show. It's inward heart position. Jesus had a lot to say about that. It's the heart, it's the heart. Where are you in your heart and in your mind concerning the Lord? Yes, he wants a pure heart position to be reflected in outward act, but not just some kind of a pretense out here. Not just coming to church and maybe making an offering every so often. God wants you to love him first. Number one, that's the first and greatest commandment, Jesus said. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Is it really that hard? He loved us first. He demonstrated his great love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so John says we love him because he first loved us. That comes first. And we're reminded here. Samuel said, get your hearts right before the Lord. Get your hearts right. And then let's see some outward act that reflects this. Put away the phony gods and serve the Lord your God only. And they did that. And you know what they did? They aroused the hostility and suspicion of the Philistines. The Philistines came to march against Israel, and Israel soundly defeated them. That's what happens if we continue reading. Israel prevailed a wonderful, tremendous victory over the Philistines. And Israel was so happy. We're going to read one uh, final passage here. Look at verse 12. 1 Samuel 7, 12. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen and called its name Ebenezer, 
saying, thus far the Lord has helped us. Ebenezer means stone of help. Thus far the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued, and they did not come any more into the territory of Israel, and the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. God had made good on his promises. He had been promising in the Mosaic Law and all the way up to this very moment, Israel, if you will love me and obey me and trust me, I will deliver you from the hand of all your enemies. And at this time in Israel's history, it was, it was the Philistines, their most hated and uh, feared enemy. And they came back after 20 years and actually repented, got their hearts right before the Lord, and look what happened. The Philistines marched against Israel and they were soundly defeated. And God made good on his promises. Notice this memorial that was set up, a giant stone set up. Ebenezer, the stone of help, so that Israel would have a memorial and never forget. You know, doesn't that remind you of Jesus? Isn't Jesus the rock? He is our rock. In fact, the Bible calls Jesus the chief cornerstone of, this great of a great foundation that holds up a wonderful edifice called the temple of God, the church of the living God, the church of the firstborn. That's us, the pillar and the ground, says Paul, of the truth. We are the custodians of God's written revelation, the word, the church, built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ, the Lord, the chief cornerstone. And this rock here that's set up, Ebenezer, reminds me of the Lord Jesus. Rejected of men, yes, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, but precious to God and to us. He is God's elect, and he is loved by us. Samuel says in verse 12, Thus far, the Lord has helped us. Friends, that's maybe your story too. That's my story. Can you look back on your life and say, up until now, God has helped me? Can you do that? I see heads nodding. Lindy and I often will contemplate our own personal history together. And we see where God has navigated us around danger, error, deception. We can see dark periods where things were very confusing, Seeming hopeless, sad, we felt lost, we know. And now we can look back and say, up until now, God has helped us. This church collectively can say that, honestly, can't we say it? Up until now, God has helped us, oh. He has answered prayer in spectacular ways. But uh, friends, I want to end with this, and this is a little transition here. Your personal history with the Lord, this launch pad into this blessed time where God has been walking with you, helping you, leading and guiding you, protecting you, instructing you, that began with the loving witness of somebody, didn't it? My personal faith walk began when somebody came into the gym one morning and began to tell me about Jesus Christ. And from that point on, I can say, truly, God's been walking with me, and up until now, he's been helping me. Well, you know, friends, Pastor Gilbert over there, uh, he's going to do this magnificent thing for some people living in the jungle. He is hopefully going to share the gospel powerfully, effectively. We're going to ask God to make it irresistible and uh, maybe launch somebody new in the world on their personal history of faith with Jesus. So um, hopefully that wasn't too clumsy of a segue. <laughs> but I'm going to call Pastor Gilbert up uh, now so we can pray for him so that we can see more lovers of Jesus in the world, that the army of God would swell in number, that the gospel of Jesus Christ would shine its light into the most darkest and remote places on the earth, places where Satan is followed outright. We want to take that territory back for the kingdom of God's sake. And we want to start a personal journey of faith. We want to see that happen, right? And this is God's man right now it, for Suriname. We can't go to Suriname, but he can. So uh, I want to pray for you, brother. And um, I have no idea what I'm going to say, but the Holy Spirit does. Let's join our hearts, please, together right now. And let's come to God's throne of grace. What a beautiful place that is, the throne of grace. Almighty God, 
We come to you now in the name of Jesus Christ on, on his merits alone. We will confess, Lord, before God, angels, and men, that we have nothing in ourselves to commend ourselves to you, O God. But we will confess that Jesus Christ is very great. We thank you for what he has done for us. We thank you for what he did on that cross. Still very mysterious to us, Lord, but we understand that through Jesus Christ, we may have bold access to God. Reconciliation through his blood. Lord, we want to commend our beloved associate pastor, pa Gilbert here, Pastor Gilbert, to your care and ministry. We ask you, God, as a church family, to empower this man with the Holy Spirit of God. Lead this man. Protect him. God, speak to his heart. Show him wonderful things from your word. Equip him fully. Uh, encourage him in the work. May he never feel discouraged in what he's doing. May he see the fruit of his labors, dear God. We pray for the mission field that, over there in Suriname. We pray for the fledgling church. We pray, God, that everybody would be confronted with the glory of Jesus afresh, that he would become so beautiful to them, so worth serving and honoring, that they would be um, absolutely unstoppable in their work. We pray against all power of the enemy in the jungle. We pray that the light of Jesus Christ would shine so brightly that demonic forces would retreat into the darkness and that that darkness would grow ever smaller and smaller, that they would have no legitimate place to practice anymore. Lord, may the church grow mightily there in the jungle for your glory, Lord Jesus. May knees bend to the Lordship of Christ, that God the Father would be glorified. And uh, Lord, may this happen even in the last of days. So we commit the work and the workers to your tender care and ministry. Oh God, for your glory and the good of your people, even the people yet to be redeemed. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God, praise God. We, we love you, brother. Please keep us informed about what's going on. I will do my best, but I already know my biggest treasure in life is being spent for the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. All right. Well, uh, worship team, are we going to do one more song? All right. And we'll ask God to seal these truths that we've been confronted with into our hearts as well. <laughs>